you know, so one of the last investors kind of said something to me that kind of resonated and were like, look, nobody's going to give you a million pounds for what you want here. Like, I'm, I'm sorry to like tell you, but with where you're at, your age, your experience, nobody's going to risk that on you. Like, but, but, you know, go away and design something for half a million pounds that's more profitable, make a success of that. And then somebody will then invest like a larger amount in you. This is part one of my conversation with Richard. I, I do know Richard actually through my work in the homelessness sector. I volunteer for Crisis in Birmingham. That's not how I met Richard though. I met Richard through actually me getting some business support and he is a lecturer as well. And he was giving me a presentation and we got onto the topic of homelessness. This was literally almost like a one on one kind of tuition. And I realized he was so passionate about homelessness. And we've been talking for quite a while. And I finally said to him, why don't you come on my podcast so we can talk about your journey, uh, how you got interested in doing this, how you came to become, you know, in the teaching profession as well, and what you're up to. So now this this is nearly an hour long and Richard had loads to say and we will continue on part two. So please watch out for that and we w where we will be getting into the depth of it. But just in this little introduction, Richard talks about, you know, investors telling him that he was too young, he didn't have the experience, etc. Whereas at the time that he was looking for it, he definitely did have the experience. And obviously investors expect you to be, you know, much older, have a lot more experience behind you before they're going to invest in you. Anyway, fantastic story, fantastic journey that Richard's been on. Go and listen to part one and then make sure you listen to part two. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Richard. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, and just for our listeners, we do know each other uh, and we've known each other for a bit. So, um, but I'm going to pretend that everything you tell me is new. <laughs> and that I've not heard it before, uh, but I'm also wanting to learn about the bits that I don't know. So we're going to start off with the first question, which is tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? A bit about your education. Have you moved around where you now live mm -hmm. and all of that? And then we'll get into your first job and we'll go from there. So over to you. Yeah, so I was born in Warsaw in the West Midlands, uh, and I guess I kind of lived around that area till I was about nine or ten years old. Yeah, um, my dad was um, a journalist, and um, so he worked at the Birmingham Post and Mail, but they were making redundancies, and he needed to find a new position. And the only position he could manage to find was on um, the um down in down in Plymouth so we actually kind of moved to to Devon yes. um when I was about nine or ten um and so I kind of finished um primary school kind of whilst I was down there in a really nice little um sort of village called Denbury so I went from being in kind of a quite large um, primary school kind of in, in Warsaw with maybe about a thousand pupils to suddenly then to be in this like little village um, primary school where there was only a hundred pupils in, wow. in, in, in total. Um, and then we stayed in Devon till I was about 16 or 17. So I did kind of all my secondary school um, down in, down in Devon. So it's a nice area to, to grow up and to to kind of live and and we moved down there really just because 
uh, obviously sort of unfortunately there were sort of redundancies being made sort of in the journalism sort of sector um, and the paper that my dad was working on sort of in Birmingham and then we yeah we had to kind of move down there but it was a nice kind of place to 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 grow up and I made some good friends and absolutely you, you could go out and about it was a lot more sort of rural than kind of what I was used to in in Warsaw so you were by the seaside and and things like that so yeah it, it, um, and then when I was about uh, 16 or 17 my dad got made redundant on the newspaper down in Devon my, my dad has a track record of um, of getting made redundant quite a lot of times he did at one point say that he thought his best bet was to to kind of write to newspapers and say, I won't work for you um, if you pay me a retainer and then, then you know, you won't have to in the future by likelihood because every time I go and work for someone, they then in the future then seem to have to make redundancies. Yeah. So. Um, and then moved back to, to, to the Midlands when I was 16, 17 um, to Birmingham. And I went to college um, in Birmingham for – um, a few years so it was nice to kind of be back in the Midlands um, and yeah studying in college for a few years and then went to study at the University of Leeds I studied fashion design management right. um, and I really loved the university mm. um, I think it was kind of the best three years of my life and it was it, it was kind of the place really where I started kind of actually being entrepreneurial. I think kind of the couple of years that I was in college, I started to think about certain, you know, sort of issues that I could see around me that I felt that, you know, society should do something about. So for example, when I was like 16 or 17, I was working fashion retail in Gap and I was like, there's loads of homeless people kind of on the streets. Like, wouldn't it be great if, mm. if like the Gap designers work with homeless individuals and design sort of clothing that could turn into sleeping bags, for example, or were more versatile and functional for those who were kind of unfortunately sort of on the streets. But so kind of, I was kind of thinking about these things whilst I was at college, but it wasn't until I, I, I went to university and I suddenly found that you only have about 10 or 12 hours of lectures a week yes and and I could kind of you know sort of do the work that I needed to but actually that I had quite a lot of spare time like a lot of friends would maybe just you know sort of play football and drink and eat pizza and I kind of did all that but um I kind of felt like actually this is a really good opportunity on top of my studies to start actually getting some good practical experience and whilst I was away at university I, I kind of realized that oh you know this is going to end in three years and actually if I'm going to gain employment this is an opportunity in time to get the experience that I need to to be able to secure a position when I when I when I graduated, so I kind of started my entrepreneurial journey whilst I was at university. But it was more to get the experience to go and gain employment, um, mm. and I actually started approaching organisations like Big Issue, Oxfam, Salvation Army, Homeless World Cup, sort of Age UK, because initially I tried to get work experience in the fashion industry, but being from Birmingham and studying in Leeds, I couldn't afford to to go down to London. Right. So it was really difficult to get fashion based work experience in Birmingham or Leeds. So yes. I was like, I'm happy to just volunteer and to work and um but nobody all the commercial companies that i approached didn't seem to have any opportunities so i thought okay let, let's create an opportunity and i kind of thought back over the last few years and thought well you've had lots of kind of ideas around kind of supporting sort of social and community development and actually charities and social organizations they want volunteers so maybe the way that you can gain kind of experience is to approach some of these and and i can run some fashion-based sort of projects with them so I'm kind of, they're happy to have volunteers. I'm getting fashion-based experience. And so that when I graduate, you know, I'll have the experience that I need to kind of move forward and, and gain employment. So I'd like to ask a question at this point about that. So there's two things you've mentioned, which is yeah. like the charity sector mm -hmm. and then the kind of entrepreneurship of being entrepreneurial. Yeah. Where did both of these come from? So... Did somebody inspire you? Did you, you know, did you learn this in college or in university that you've got to be entrepreneurial or where did it come from? Did you read about it? 
I think kind of without actually realising it was more subconsciously. It's only kind of last couple of years where I've actually kind of sat down and I've, I've actually thought about this, like where where does this drive or sort of, you know, me wanting to be entrepreneurial um, sort of kind of, kind of come from and I think as a family kind of the latent side um, of my family they've tended to actually kind of work for themselves and although my my dad worked for for um, newspapers quite often the reason why the papers would seem to kind of um, go bust and make redundancies was because he'd actually go and support kind of newly set up newspapers so he was kind of my dad really looking back out of it was a bit of a, a, a an, you know an entrepreneur if you like so he launched uh, I think the first um, British speaking newspaper um, on the Costa del Sol in, in, in Spain he helped launch at the time I think um, the world's um, largest group of weekly newspapers in Birmingham and then he kind of helped set up a, another group of newspapers as well in Birmingham but they were just produced and published on a Sunday so actually although my dad was kind of employed I mean towards the end of his career he started to freelance more because he didn't have to worry about you know, paying the mortgage, you know, as much or, you know, me and my brother had kind of moved on. So, so actually kind of the lane side of my family and my, my dad was actually quite entrepreneurial, but it was very kind of subconscious. I, I yes. don't think I kind of really realized that. No, so all. it wasn't, it wasn't like you'd been on a training program about entrepreneurship no. or anything like that. No. And then kind of, so the, that's the entrepreneurship side. And I would really say again, like my mom and dad, you know, were, you know, the, uh, a very caring kind of, you know, caring, kind and considerate individuals. And, mm. and I kind of recognized how lucky and fortunate I was to have a nice family that I could go to university or college. And I, I kind of had all the opportunities that, you know, someone could ever really wish for. I mean, we didn't have everything, but, you know, in general, there was a really great foundation there, a good loving family, and there was support. So I think the entrepreneurial side came through my dad, but without necessarily realizing or recognizing that. And, and, and you know, I think he'd need to do some reflection to probably recognize that as well. Yeah. And then obviously the caring and kind side again comes from, from kind of mom and dad who were very caring and kind. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was like a a, a, a subconscious amalgamation yes. if you like it wasn't I, I i didn't kind of grow up thinking you know oh i want to be a you know a social entrepreneur for example or, mm. or, or or an entrepreneur it's just that i was really creative i seemed to be quite innovative i could spot you know sort of gaps in the market for products or services um that i went down avenues to try and gain commercial work experience and that didn't quite work so mm. i kind of volunteered for charitable and social organizations instead because they were always looking for volunteers and things just kind of fell um into place really brilliant um, yeah okay yeah. so so where where so you were at university trying yeah. to come up with some of those ideas uh -huh. and how did they manifest presumably you finish your course at least <sighs> Yeah, I did. Yeah, I finished the course, but I was kind of coming towards the end of my first year and I was trying to get work experience in the first year. And I was finding it difficult. And I was like, if I don't really start to get some now, mm. I was I was on a new course at university and I was a bit worried it wasn't as practically kind of not, uh, and sort of business or, you know, sort of enterprise sort of focused. And I was like, it's really missing that commercial element. So towards the end of my first year, I kind of, again, I'd work fashion retail in my first year, yes. um, sort of work for diesel but i was at a point where you know again i was fortunate that my you know my parents would pay my fees they were only about 1100 at the time they're not as expensive as they were and they would pay my accommodation so i kind of saved money from working retail and i was like i don't really need the money so actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to give up working and just volunteer instead to get to get the experience that i want and right. the fir first project that i put into action was um again like I, I mentioned before when i worked at gap i was thinking what if gap designers homeless people and kind of design clothing that would make it more comfortable to kind of live on the streets so i kind of like i said i recognized that i'd been really fortunate and i recognized that actually you know that 
if someone else was born into my position, they would be studying fashion at university if that's what they wanted to do. And equally, actually, that person on the street, if I was born into their situation, the likelihood is that we it would have just been a role reversal. So I kind of felt that it was unfair that beans is like what you're born into, that everybody doesn't have equal opportunities. So I thought, what if I, for example, kind of condensed my three-year degree into a three-month course where I can teach individuals from disadvantaged and socially excluded backgrounds all the processes involved in the design, production, promotion and retail of fashion-based products. So I created this fashion design and its commercial development course and I worked with a big issue in Leeds and Birmingham and and sort of delivered this working with big issue vendors in, in a team. So I was studying fashion design management and again from the work experience side if I was to go and gain employment in the fashion sector, I didn't necessarily want to be a designer. I wanted to sort of be a creative director, someone that yes. would direct and manage other designers. So yes. I thought, well, actually, I'm going to look to set up a project where I can direct and manage other designers. But actually, my, my designers are going to be homeless individuals and I'm going to actually have to teach them how to design. Yeah. And collectively, the end outcome of the course was that we we designed a brand uh, or created a brand based and influenced around homelessness. And then our designs were kind of, um, sort of based and taking influence from the streets and people's perceptions on kind of homelessness. Right. Uh, and I was always kind of wary about sort of sustainability and things. So I was like, well, it's an education course, but actually how is it going to be funded? And I didn't want to necessarily create qualifications that people could do because I recognize that okay I can go to university but some people don't have the time the energy the effort the funds the qualifications to you know to go and do another qualification yeah. you know, that they might you know have to look after other people have dependents or you know, they might not have that great an educational background or they don't have that much expendable income so I was like well if I kind of deliver the course and support them and they're designing and creating products then obviously if we then retail them products then that can be reinvested into the scheme to then sort of fund it and you know quite naively and idealistically at the time because I would have only been like you know 18 19 20 at the time when I was running that project you know in my mind I was like okay well if I can support these homeless individuals to create these designs we can start to sell some of these we can actually then get a store going and then some that want to work as in fashion retail or or in the stock room can kind of, you know, go down that route. Those who want to work in head offices, designers or the warehouses kind of. And before I knew it in my mind, I'd kind of create this big national <laughs> brand where I'd be training homeless people. It yeah. sounds really crazy. Like, um, But you had a vision, didn't you? Yeah, I had a vision. And actually later on, I did, I did set up and run another project. That, that kind of in the end I actually had a retail store that that, that that did kind of in a way kind of do that but I, I had that vision and for me what was really nice is like I had the opportunity really to to not just like 90% of the people out there just to sort of have an idea and sit on that for I think on average it says it takes what like seven eight years I've read before mm. from someone having an idea to actually implementing it so at least within you know a couple of years and fairly young and early on and quite naively I had this idea and then I put it into practice and then I started to kind of realize you know oh actually you know these are the reasons why people are homeless and actually kind of this isn't necessarily going to be quite feasible, you know, or, you know, this is something that I want to do nationally. But actually the big issue, for example, is seven or eight different organizations in the UK. And then yes. suddenly realized that if I was going to roll out this concept nationally, that I was going to have to get all these organizations all on board and in sync working with one another yeah. to kind of create the impact that I wanted. Um, so it, it was a good experience and then kind of knowing that I couldn't necessarily bring that vision to fruition at the scale that I wanted. And equally, I, I approached the big issue because above the big issue is something called the International Network of Street Papers. So there's street newspapers all yes. over the world, you know, Brazil, Japan, South Africa. So I thought if I can make this work in Leeds and Birmingham and then nationally in the UK, I can make it work internationally. So I looked for the networks and the avenues to do it, but then I found that these existing networks kind of 
they were happy doing what they were going to do and it was difficult to sell new innovative approaches in and again at the time we didn't have the technology i mean looking no. back now like you have things like crowdfunding now or you have online portals where you know for example i could have video recorded myself delivering sessions and these could be viewed anywhere across the world you know the, the individual homeless individuals who were doing the courses for like the big issue in australia or south africa you know they could sit through these tutorials they could create the designs they could email them you know centrally kind of to us over here and you know so kind of looking back i can now see kind of ways that i could have scaled that without using yes. the organization's infrastructure themselves but to be fair 15 years ago technology wasn't there of course and not. i didn't necessarily have the insight and there was there wasn't other people necessarily using technology like that you know if i was going to do that today it's very very obvious but at the time it was like we have to be able to physically be there we have to be able to create products and i have to be able to get it in retail tailors like top shop urban outfit selfridges and if we can't do that the project can't happen whereas today actually Everything can be done remotely. You yeah. can have things like crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah. Lots of people buy online, but actually those technologies, those platforms, they kind of existed 15 years ago, but they weren't as prevalent. Mm. You know, So I kind of moved on to other projects, like I said, with Oxfam, Salvation Army, Homeless World Cup, you know, in Age UK, just to kind of get that experience. And then when I graduated from university, I kind of thought, great. Okay, so my, my, my sort of, aim like a lot of young entrepreneurs maybe was that like oh i'll go to university but actually i'd really love to set up a project and it become that successful that i don't finish university but obviously kind of the things that i did were successful socially but not necessarily commercially so i kind of finished university and i thought right great i'll, I'll go and get a job now i've got the experience that i need so i started applying for fashion-based roles and that's obviously looking back it's very competitive industry maybe one in four so 25 percent of fashion graduates only go on to gain employment right and I'd, I'd be applying for roles and i'd be talking about my experience and people would be like yeah but you've been working with like homeless individuals and charities and mm. you know kind of met you know i can see why you were doing it but you know we're looking for more commercial experience because <sighs> you can't quite hit the ground running you're not quite right for us yet but yeah. you know so then i thought well okay let's you know if the fashion industry is telling me that you know maybe i should be going to work with social organizations so then i started applying for some social organizations trying to do this and then be like yeah but you've got a fashion degree <laughs> so I, so i was like caught in the middle so with the other 75 percent of fashion graduates so i was kind of caught in the middle and i was like there seems to be this gap between university and education and the commercial sector where yes. people need to be able to get the experience to gain employment you know or actually if you're quite entrepreneurial like you know and you could set up and run your own initiative quite often people won't back and support young entrepreneurs so i'd i'd obviously work with big issue vendors to create a fashion brand based in influence and homelessness i'd approach large fashion retailers to try and get stocked in top shop and outfitters and selfridges but i couldn't get anywhere with the buyers you know so i kind of again it was like well even if you can set up and run your own label you can't no one will stock you because you're unknown that's right so, yeah. so i kind of felt like there's this gap and there's this bridge and that there's a need for an organization that either allows fashion graduates or graduates you know in general you know to come and get the experience they need to then gain employment or if you're entrepreneurial and can set up um your own products and services there need to be an organization that gives you space to do that gives you backing and then the credibility to almost lean on some of the partners and collaborators investors that you need to move your product to, and and service forward as a young graduate entrepreneur to say look you really should listen to this person actually they do they do kind of know what they're doing so yes. so what i did was i kind of and and part of it was motivated by it again that i recognized that time was going on i was applying for jobs and i didn't want to kind of say to people you know so what have you been doing for six months and more well, basically i've been sat at home in my pants applying for jobs like <laughs> So I kind of thought, well, I actually want to say to them, well, I've been applying for jobs. I've been getting feedback and some of them have been saying I haven't got enough commercial experience. So I've been set up and running my own project to get that whilst I find employment. So 
I started getting hold of loads of empty retail stores uh, and basically creating spaces where local young designers could sell their designs. And then above the stores themselves, I created little incubation spaces where they could work and run and set up labels. And equally, like, you know, fashion students and graduates or design students and graduates could come in and get some work experience and, and support the, you know, the student and graduate startups. And then in the evening, when the designers weren't using, like, the equipment facilities and resources upstairs i could continue to run some of my projects where i would teach and train individuals from disadvantaged and socially excluded backgrounds that wanted to get into you know fashion design or retail and, and for, who for helped, example who helped you with that Maybe. so it's something that i did off my own back so i actually you know i went out there and i approached kind of you know, sort of landlords and organizations for help and support. So it's something I did myself and initially put my own capital in. Right. But as I kind of started to make some headway, I, I did really fortunately, I got a, a 500 pound community cash award grant from the Prince's Trust, which kind of helped me to to set up the first store. And then kind of when, when I was running that store, someone said to me one day, they were like, you're a social entrepreneur, aren't you? And I was like, what's a social entrepreneur? I was like, I'd never heard of that. I just no. thought I was like someone that liked to be on entrepreneurial for social purpose. I didn't realize that that was that, that a was thing. a demographic, <laughs> demographic or a category or yes. a so I, you know, I Googled social entrepreneur and then I suddenly found like, oh, there's something called the School for Social Entrepreneurs. So I'll apply for that and go to that. And, right. And, and like I found things like the Prince's Trust, like Community Cash Award because of that. And then I was like, oh, there's this organization called Unlimited where I can get a five thousand yeah. pound, you know, grant for running social projects. So yeah. I kind of through like being entrepreneurial putting my money where my mouth was if you like and giving things a go you know and then other people come across me and saying do you realize this is what you are and what you're doing and you're creating a social enterprise because even to that point i was like i didn't know that was a social enterprise right. like I, kn I knew i was i knew i was in a charity uh, but you know i knew i wasn't necessarily a commercial i wasn't doing it to make money i was i knew i, I wanted to and had to make money but my ideals were the more money I could make, the more people I could help and kind of support. So I was suddenly finding out, you know, and this was maybe five years after I started that, oh, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. And actually there's a community of like-minded individuals like me. And I started to get in-kind help and support, some small grants that allowed me to kind of move and push things forward. And I got to the stage where I kind of trial and tested this kind of, um space where you know students can come out of university they they could kind of work there start up you know creative enterprises you know i could give them the space to to work to sell their product or service maybe even offer them accommodation even to kind of live on site so that they could really immerse themselves 24 7 in what they were doing so that there was this community around them like of like-minded individuals who were all trying to move forward and strive as well as like you know supporting other people around them that wanted to get work experience to gain employment and i trialed and tested and i i business planned the model and suddenly realized that if i was going to do this properly that gosh i i actually need to raise something like a million pounds and instead of like you know leasing a place i actually need to buy it and redevelop yes. it and but i kind of started to look into raising investment and and um you know could see that i was quite young and that you know the whole reason why i was trying to set up this platform or, you know, concept or organization, whatever you want to kind of look at it was with because young people weren't actually being backed and supported. Mm. So I kind of went out there and tried to look to raise some of this money, but kind of I don't really think, you know, again, sort of 10 years ago, people would take young people as seriously. Maybe today in, and in certain sectors, like you hear of 20, 25-year-olds raising millions of pounds for tech startups. Yes. But again, 10 years ago, that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't kind of around. So I recognized I actually needed to start to kind of you know, have collaborating partner with large organizations, have mm. people behind me 
backing me who were a little older and had a larger track record and equally who had more money and capital to put into things. So if you went to someone and was asking for a million pound loan, you know, if you were turning over 30 million pounds and had 300 million pounds worth of assets, nobody's going to flinch. But if you say, you know, I'm a young person, I've set up, you know, some shops, I've been turning over a few thousand pounds a week, you know, this is my track record. Can you, you know, I've got no security or capital to put no. against the loan. Can I have this million pounds? Like mm. at the time, like, you know, obviously in my naivety, you couldn't necessarily understand why people weren't backing you and supporting you. <laughs> I can look back now and I obviously understand and know the reasons. I don't necessarily still agree with those reasons, but I understand why that they're, you know, why that they're kind of there. So in my mind, I was like, I needed some opportunity and I was really fortunate the my first graduate level position that I created and again I say to a lot of sort of students and graduates that you know even if you're just op- entre- entrepreneurial you don't necessarily want to set up or run your own product or service or organization if you're just entrepreneurial as a mindset in life you'll create more opportunities than other people so this really large social investment group came across that basically ran a charitable housing association and a care and support arm came across me and was were like I did a little bit of work for them and, and they said, oh, well, you know, I was like, where's your head office? I'll drop some, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll drop this off to you. Uh, and when I say work, when I was running these retail stores to sell local young designers, when I was sat in the stores, obviously you didn't have customers all the time. So I had things like, you know, pin badge making machines. So I just make pin badges for local, like, you know, organizations or people that wanted just to sort of do in downtime to make an extra, you know, five or 10 quid an hour here or there. And so I made some pin badges um, and I printed some, some garments, some sort of t-shirts and hooded tops sort of for, for them for an event that they had. And I just dropped them to the head office uh, and sort of unbeknown to me, I dropped them off to to this lady and she actually worked in HR. And she was like, oh, I've talked to the managing director about you. Can you just kind of say hello to him? So I just went in because, like I said, the, their, their head office was a 10 minute the shop that I was running at, at the time obviously wasn't close to, to their head office, but my actual home was about a 10 minute walk down the road. Right. And so I just sort of popped in, dropped it off and thought, yeah, I'll go and talk to him and say hello. And I just, you know, I said hello as myself and he's like, Oh, can you come back in next week? You know, like, you know, my, my colleagues talk to me, sound like really interesting. And I just want to hear about what you've been up to. And I've been like, great, actually like one of the major issues that I had at the time running retail stores is that, only registered charities have business rates relief. So if you're renting a store, for example, for £100,000 a year, a bit like you have council tax on your house house at home of a couple of grand a year, but if you're renting like a retail store, you have to pay these things called business rates. So it's like council tax, but for a commercial property. But if you're paying £100,000 a year rent, quite often it's 30 30 to 40%, depending on the unit, will be business rates. So you know, so sometimes you could you could negotiate rents down to something that's more, you know, payable for you or that landlords would give you rent free periods for a time. But you could never get the business rates down with that. So you, quite often I'd make enough money to cover all the, the 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 a little bit of rental, the utilities and, and obviously pay the rates. But there wasn't a lot of money the other side to kind of pay a you know, myself a bit of a salary to kind of live on. Yeah. But I recognize that, oh, actually, if I was a charity doing this, I'd only pay 20% rate. So I'd mm. be paying, for example, instead of paying £30,000 a year, I'd be paying six. And that £24,000 I was saving is suddenly a bit of a salary for myself. So I was interested in trying to, I was thinking of, do I actually become a charity? But I didn't want to be a charity but if, because I didn't want to necessarily create more organizations so i thought well maybe if i started partnering and working with or through or for a charity then then some of my projects would be more commercially successful because you know uh, the you know government makes concessions for business rates of vat and other things like that to recognize that you are formally registered but unfortunately yes. we're, we're still in a position now that unless you're a registered charity government won't necessarily recognize your social value and give no. you concessions and obviously if you're a social organization 
it costs you more to run the organization because you're helping and supporting less vulnerable individuals. So there's a higher cost there than input. So then supporting, you know, you know, a young graduate, for example, with high level of skills, experience and expertise and education. And then obviously you make less money because, you know, you're supporting those individuals and they're not necessarily as commercially minded or focused. So if any social organization that run, there's usually this paradigm where it costs more to run and you make less. So there kind of needs to be a bit of a subsidy in the middle. And if you're a registered charity, you can kind of get that. But sure. actually I didn't want to be a registered charity. I just wanted to be a normal organization and for government or local authority to recognize the added value that you were creating to society and to actually gift you that. You know, that's still a long way off. And maybe mm. in the future, that might, that might come. I've, it's I've created needed. models. It's, it's needed, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, like with the social enterprise that I run now, I say by the city council, £90,000 a year in housing benefit. You know, so it's kind of like I'm saving you £90,000 a year in housing benefit, but I can't really pay myself, you know, a salary. So it's kind of like... <laughs> You know, you'd think that they'd view that as, oh, okay, you're saving us money, you're doing a good job, you could actually do more. If we subsidised, you know, or made concessions for you, then actually if you can work on this full time, you can create more social impact that will help more people, that will save us more money. But, but yeah, like I said, quite a way off. But I was fortunate enough for this large organisation to come across me. I I went and met with the managing director for this £30 million social investment organisation with lots yeah. of care and support services and lots of social housing, own £300 million worth of assets. Just literally like just talking to them about my vision and what I wanted to do. At the end of the interview, he was like, you're going to come and work for me as a social entrepreneur in residence and you're going to come and do this. And I was like, this was a job interview. Wow. Like I, I didn't even recognize or realize. I just thought, you know, someone's, someone's asked to talk to me and listen listen to me and at this stage I was so busy that you didn't have time to tell people your story because I was working six nights a week in an off license mm. and 12 10 or 12 hours on a Sunday so in the evenings I was working a full-time job to bring in enough money for me to make a living from and then obviously in the days I then had free to like run my own projects so to run the retail stores and like I said I didn't generate enough of a surplus to make a full-time living so as I'd, I'd, I'd get to the shop for eight or nine in the morning I'd close up sort of five o'clock I'd then go to the off license for six then I'd work to 10 or 11 and obviously I'd do that you know six days a week and then on wow. a Sunday I'd work 10 or 12 days in an off license so up until that point it's like you know, I didn't have a lot of time to go and meet people and tell them what I was doing because I was either running these stores or I was in an off license earning, <laughs> you know, money. So, and again, you didn't really have social media. You didn't have like YouTube really. You didn't have Instagram. You know, I was doing a bit of blogging here or there. Like I was running a bit of a blog about what I was doing, but you know, there wasn't so much the traction that there was kind of today. So, and yeah, and so I I thought, well, do you know what? The shop's coming to an end. I need I need to be running larger projects. I need to have a bigger track record than just getting hold of, you know, I've got a hold of five grand here and now I'm turning over fifty grand or a hundred grand there. I needed to kind of get hold of five hundred thousand pounds and be turning over like, you know, sort of five million pounds here or there. So I just thought, well, actually, it's a good time that I can go and work three days a week as a social entrepreneur in residence, mm -hmm. for this organization. They run lots of interesting services. They turn over lots of money. I can start to get to this track record where maybe some of these investors that I've approached could start to back and support me a little more. And then maybe in three or four years down the line, I could, I could, you know, go back to my own projects with this track record. So over a three-year period, I worked with this organization's tenants, um, service users, and staff to to support them really to design, develop, and implement social enterprise initiatives that would add value to their existing services right. that would help them tender for and win and, um, you know, new contracts. Right in these types of areas like local authority and government contracts, but equally, you know, help them win new ones. So an example um, was, you know, this organization, it runs a homeless hostel in Birmingham city center. And we obviously, you know, we're housing individuals at risk of homelessness, but we wanted to create opportunities for them to get 
um, sort of work experience so they could get employment and start to generate an income and then live independently and move on. So we got, I, you know, we got a hold of an empty retail unit in Birmingham city centre. We kind of worked in partnership with, cause this organization ran a clothing bank and I was like, there's a lot of surplus clothing here. Obviously the homeless people take what they want, but there's a lot of surplus clothing here that could actually, you know, and quite a lot of it is vintage and retro and actually, there seems to be quite a lot of homeless clothing banks all over Birmingham. So if I could kind of pull all these homeless clothing banks in Birmingham together, and they could supply us with a surplus clothing once the homeless individuals have taken what they want, and we could sort this, we could actually set up our own vintage store. Right. Uh, and so kind of one of the, the nine social enterprises that I helped them set up over three years as a social entrepreneur in residence was, you know, as an example of some of the work that I did, was a vintage store in the Great Western Arcade, which is a really nice Victorian arcade in the city centre. Yeah. And it obviously sold this surplus clothing from homeless clothing banks in Birmingham. The manager was a young person, not in education, in employment and training, so a neat that wanted to get experience to go and get fashion retail. And then we we ran sort of retail, sort of little retail training courses for individuals at risk of homelessness that wanted to get training and employment in fashion retail and then we allowed some of them to kind of volunteer and get work experience and then obviously kind of move them through and forward Mm. but uh, the challenge that I kind of found through that is like I was finding at the time I can't really run my own organization because I'm not making enough money to employ myself although I'm saving government and the taxpayer a lot of money I can't because it costs more to run a social organization and you make less I couldn't make enough to make a living and it was tiring like You know, maybe by this point, I'd spent five years, like, literally working seven days, you know, or seven evenings a week, or you know, in an off license, and then the other six or seven days in my own. So it was literally like you wouldn't have a day off. You wouldn't have a spare second, which I really loved and enjoyed, but it was like longer term, this necessarily isn't kind of, you know, sustainable and stuff. So I kind of, you know, went with the right intentions to work and do projects like this through other social organizations with more capacity and more of a track record but then i found that they'd be really risk averse you know so you'd set up one store and you say this is working really well actually we can take the next unit on next door and actually we could have like a vintage tea room and we could sell some small household furniture and vinyl as well and and actually like some agents are talking to me that own the great western arcade like in birmingham they've actually got arcades all over the uk and they're saying they're quite like this model and actually do we want space in you know in leeds you know in in sheffield in kind of you know bristol and things like that and you were putting it to the charitable organization and say look you know there's homeless clothing banks all over the country you know there's arcades there's organizations there's people in need we can really do this but then you know they'd pull the reins on things and say well we let's just slow down you know that's too much of a risk for us you know we need to so i was kind of getting frustrated that i couldn't really scale and have the impact that i wanted and equally obviously like I was setting up projects for them, you know, for myself, uh, you know, starting off with 500 quid to 5,000. But for them, I was maybe setting up projects for 10 to 15 sort of thousand. And I I wasn't, you know, although they were turning over a lot of money and I was thinking, yeah, if I come up with a great concept, they'll really invest in this. They were too risk averse, really, and institutionalized in a way to that, oh, well, if someone can give us, you know, a million pound grant, we'll do that, but we wouldn't loan a million pounds for it. And I'm like, but why wouldn't you? Because it's sustainable, it's replicable, you've got the track record, and actually it's quicker to loan the money rather than to fill out lots of forms and wait for years for somebody. And equally, if you turn over three million pounds or 30 million pounds and have 300 million pounds worth of assets i was like nobody's going to give you free money if you turn over 30 million pounds a year so i kind of (laughs) got to the stage where i've got some good track record i kind of had a better understanding of the sector and how it worked and operated i was still driven to sort of set up and run my own things i'd kind of started to realize how to do that um and I was like, okay, let's raise some more investment. But I kind of recognized that most of the investment raised was down in London and it was quite expensive. And I didn't have the time as well at the time to go down to London and back talking to people. And so I was like, okay, let's see if I can, you know, I can finish my position as a social entrepreneur in residence, which I'm really proud of actually. 
kind of I didn't know at the time, but I kind of I since found out that um, someone a couple of months who was employed as a social entrepreneur in residence, they they had kind of a lot of press and publicity. It was through the Young Foundation. Mm. And I saw articles in The Guardian saying that they were the first person in the UK to be employed as a social entrepreneur in residence. Mm. So, so kind of, you know, what I kind of say to people, which is kind of nice in a way, is that I was the first male in Britain to be employed as a social entrepreneur uh-huh. in residence, which I think so. I wasn't the first person. No. Obviously she was a female, so I can't say the first person, but no. I can say I was the first male in Britain to be employed as a social sort of, you know, it's, sort of entrepreneur, which yeah. is, which, I mean, which is in- great. It's incredible just kind of reflecting back on the journey, I guess. And I know we're not at the end of it. There's lots yeah. more. There's lots more. And I'm conscious of time because I know you've, you're tight for time. But yeah. um, just to kind of interject and get your breath for a second, um, the, the whole thing with you, you know, seeing that there was a need in this area, doing your own little projects, um, although, yeah, it was incredibly hard work. You did get noticed by somebody. Yeah, and it that, was worth the it risk. It was worth was, the yeah. hard work, wasn't it? Yeah. Because it then allowed you to to go and get some real meat on the bone. Uh, yeah, we're other people's money for their benefit, fair enough. Yeah. But it also meant you were getting some incredible experience there. Yeah, and starting to get to a level and a track record where actually, okay, you know, I'd look to raise a million pounds, but actually, you know, that might be a bit of a far sort of reach. But actually, you know, if I was talking to people of, you know, sort of loaning 50, 150,000 pounds, people kind of weren't really flinching. So Mm. I could see that I was... I was slowly kind of edging forward and like I did really want to organically grow things, but you know, a lot of businesses kind of reach a point where you're like, this is the scale I want to run on operate on. And there's, there's a gap here and actually like I need capital to kind of sort of bridge that gap. So I, I took an opportunity to go and work for London College of Fashion down in London to set up a social enterprise for them. So a fashion-based social enterprise in right. HMP Holloway, which is the largest female prison in the UK, to set up a fashion training and manufacture facility where female offenders do MVQ qualifications to become machinists. Yeah. And um, then um, they also work on small commercial contracts. I also sort of supported them to run their fashion educations in prisons program that went into female prisons to support female offenders to create kind of a fashion magazine and sort of various issues. And then I sort of started the foundation of looking for them to support male offenders. So I did a bit of work working sort of with an in HMP Brixham to see, oh, actually, could we train up some male offenders to become tailorers so that they could come out, you know, and go into Savile Row. And obviously the female offenders who were coming out of the fashion training um, a manufacture facility they were coming out straight into factories in London because um, there's still a decent amount of machinists kind of in London and obviously like British made heritage products so you know Burberry, Aquascutum, um, Barber you know big British made brands that you know consumers in in sort of developing economies like you know in north america in asia in the middle east suddenly like they've got the money and they want to buy british made products that are made in britain you know if you're if you're you know if if you're kind of you know from china you know and you know you'd be like oh brilliant i can buy you know a burberry mac that's made in the uk this is sort of great and i don't mind paying 700 sort of pound for it so there's actually a lot of opportunity still kind of at the higher end there uh, and then one of the other things that I did, I kind of um, – somebody ang- a- added me on LinkedIn who was sort of the manager for uh, the St. Giles' Trust, which is the largest offending charity in the UK based down in London. And again, bizarrely, I was living in Camberwell down in London right. um, uh, when I was uh, – like part of the time when I was doing the contract. And their head office was a, literally a five-minute walk from where I was living. And, <laughs> and, and I supported um, them to get a coffee cart on one of – um london college of fashions campuses so they've got about six or seven campuses across london and they're all going to bring them all into one site now in stratford kind of around the olympic village but obviously at the moment they're all based over and they wanted these coffee carts kind of 
um, in and around sort of organisations in London where which could train ex-offenders. And obviously there was the link with us working with offenders. So I managed to kind of speak to the head of London College of Fashion and kind of get permission to give them space on the Curtain Road campus, which is kind of yeah. near Shoreditch and sort of Hoxton Square sort of um, to, to basically sort of have this coffee cart as well. So kind of... And then in my spare time, on my lunch breaks, in my in the evenings, I would go out and meet investors and talk and network and try and raise this million pounds. So I still, again, go and push to raise this million pound to create this platform where, you know, young graduate designers, for example, could come out of university and they could kind of live, work and retail you know, or or run or sell, you know, services with all within kind of one space. And that again, those that maybe didn't want to set up and run their own products or services, they could come and get the work experience to then go and gain employment within, you know, the creative industries like they wanted yes. to do. But I, I still wasn't at the level, even though like you know the the fashion training manufacturing facility in HMP Holloway. There was about one hundred and fifty thousand pounds worth of funding attached to that that I had to sort of manage to to, to implement. And even though I had the track record now of of kind of managing a hundred and fifty thousand pound project, you know I was going to in, in investors you know, predominantly social investors at the time that said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take less financial return in return for social kind of impact, or we understand the risks are higher for you than a normal commercial investor. But <clears throat> I didn't necessarily kind of really feel that. But every time you meet and get rejected by investors, and I probably was rejected by, you know, 20, 30, <laughs> you know, investors, um, you take things on board like and and there was you know and, and kind of you know so one of the last investors kind of said something to me that kind of resonated and they were like look nobody's going to give you a million pounds for what you want here like I'm, I'm sorry to like tell you but with where you're at your age your experience nobody's going to risk that on you like but but you know go away and design something for half a million pounds it's more profitable make a success of that and then somebody will then invest like a larger amount in you so the contract with london college of fashion was coming to an end and at that time one of the managing directors of the organization that you know five years or so previously had said come and become social entrepreneur in residence for us when i left that organization i said yes. to them look i'm leaving because you know you're not allowed to risk and I know that you want to do these things that I've been developing and working on for you, but, you know, you need to go away and create your own organization with less constraints in order for us to all collectively move forward. And I think that hit a chord with one of the directors and my contract was kind of coming to an end with London College of Fashion. They wanted to renew it, but I was kind of thinking, well, an investor said that if I go away and come up with something for half a million. So I was thinking, well, rather than work, let's go away and come up with something. But this managing director for the organization that I worked as a social entrepreneur in residence randomly out of the blue contacted me and said, I've set up my own charitable housing association. Oh, like no. I really enjoyed working with you. Please let's set something up together. And I was like, Oh my God, I've just been talking to a load of investors and they've said, you know, I could come up with something for half a million. Right. And, you know, I'm just finishing a contract that I could renew, but actually like I want to do something and I've, I need to do it in collaboration and partnership with someone else. So let's like, let's do something together. So I kind of, you know, but you need to give me a job. So I kind of <laughs> gave up my 45,000 pound a year project, you know, sort of management role for London College of Fashion. And he was like, well, you know, I've got a homeless hostel you know, why don't you work in that for £7.50 an hour and, and I can give you like 20 hours a week. And I was like, so I went from earning 45000 to seven and a half thousand pounds but which was fine because then I just thought, well, okay, I've got spare time to work with the organisation, with its tenants, with its service users and actually design and develop something and quite quickly from working in homeless hostels. And obviously I'd run a lot of projects to do with homelessness. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and even like, you know, the, you know, the, the, the space where I want to support local young graduates, like that's, there's a connection to homelessness there that actually in the evenings that I'd want the, the young fashion or design graduates to pass on their skills to other people from disadvantaged and social security backgrounds. For me, the, there's a connection there that if you're training people from disadvantaged backgrounds and supporting them into employment, that is decreasing their likelihood of homeless. So it, although like, it seems quite often I'm not necessarily, you know, directly targeting homelessness in what I do. That there is a key or a chord that resonates through everything that I do that seems to kind of pull back to that for yeah. some reason, and I, yeah. I don't know why because I've never been homeless myself. For it's it's fascinating, you know, so. and but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there because I know you've got to go to another uh -huh. meeting and. I, I know there is loads more to talk about. Uh -huh. So we're going to have to do a part two if you're yeah. up for that. Yeah, I am. Yeah. OK. And then we'll, we'll get a date in the diary and do a part two because I know we're going to get where the story is going. We're going to get into the meat of it. Yeah. We, it starts getting exciting and it starts yeah. to actually like all of those <laughs> 10 years worth of time, energy yeah. and effort of, of like, you know, being successful socially, but not necessarily commercially in a way that you can start to like create models that can be replicable where people start to actually buy into your vision, think mm. that you have enough experience and a track record and things start to get exciting. Yeah. Kind of. And, and, and yeah, and it's good to kind of talk about that. And I think it's good to almost break it into two parts because a lot of people don't realize sometimes you just look at successful entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs or, or just successful individuals in in general and think like you just that's where you are and you got to there and it's behind those individuals quite often there's there's 10 years of what they'll view you know as as kind of you know failure and learning and almost like I was figuring out what not to do in order to get to a point where suddenly I knew what I, I kind of knew what to do yes. and actually other people started to recognize that I knew that and that actually I'm, a, I'm now at a point that I kind of wish I was at 10 years ago, but unfortunately nobody's going to let you mm. in the game unless mm. you get really lucky, mm. which there are a few people that do get lucky, but sure. even when you get lucky, you still have to work incredibly hard and things. So I think it's like, you know, it's making people realize that, you know, I've heard people talk about the 10,000 hours that to get good at anything, you have to work full time for 10 years and put your 10,000 hours and kind yes. of at that point where I kind of got to at London College of Fashion, which which was pretty much 10 years. I think I was like 29, 30. So it was 10 years after I'd first started actually practically trying to be socially entrepreneurial, what I know has been socially entrepreneurial then. Um, it took me to that point mm. for then people to back you like not only kind of you know physically but equally with capital and and with other kind of things but equally you up until that point you think if i just had the money things would be a lot easier and then you suddenly realize that you think you haven't been successful to this point because you haven't had the money but then yeah. actually when people start to give you the money you then start to realize there's a whole other like <laughs> you know load of learning that you want to do and just because you have the money yourself it makes it easier in some contexts, but then in other contexts there's new learning and yeah. new things that you need to realize and kind of go through and yeah well, so and that will be part two uh, Part two. We, yeah, that we're going to go. So let, let's remember where we left off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you were with this other housing association, right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll 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 have to get to the end of where you got to with them, mm -hmm. uh, and then carry on from there. So. I really appreciate your time so far, and that you're up for doing a part two because this is yeah. just so interesting. And as you know, the whole topic is very uh, close to to my heart as well, and yeah, that's why that's I think how we met. Yeah, I don't want to skimp it. I think we should give a due care and attention. So, Richard, I'll yeah. let you go. Thank you so much for your time so far, and I will be in touch very soon. Yeah, thanks, and look forward to talking again. Cheers, buddy. Take care. Bye. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 